Welcome everybody um, to today's event, uh, which is the latest and greatest and last of the school year of our Read Your Mind uh, Teen Mental Health Author Series. Uh, my name is Kelly Blue. I am the teen librarian at Portland Public Library. I use she, her pronouns. And my partner in crime is Harper Chance at the Lewiston Public Library. Uh, I'm gonna do a short introduction and then we will be hearing from our community partner at Gateway Community Services. And then we will start with the interview. Uh, today we are joined by authors Lisa Allen Agostini and uh, I.W. Eileen Gregorio to discuss how racism and different cultural perceptions of mental health affect teens and young people via their books. Our community partner for this event is Gateway Community Services, and the authors will be interviewed by local Lewiston youth Zamzam Elmonga of the Gen Z Project. I'm gonna give us a content warning for today. Uh, we will be talking about a variety of sensitive topics, including depression, anxiety, panic attacks, suicide, hospitalization, racism, and other sensitive topics. This is why we have asked our community partner to join us. Um, please feel free to direct any questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, Harper and I will be monitoring that um, and we can help you um, in the background while the interview is going on. We also want to encourage audience members to be gentle with themselves and to leave this webinar at any time if you need to. Harper is putting up a slide right now, which has some contact information for local and national organizations that you can contact, um, a lot of them via text, um, if you need to talk to anybody. And we will put that slide up again at the end of the presentation. So again, be gentle with yourselves and leave if you need to. For our Portland Public School students and our Lewiston School students, We've been asked to remind you that you do have social workers at your school and you can reach out to them. If you don't know how to reach out to them, find a trusted adult at your school and ask them, they'll be able to help you. If you or someone you know are in crisis or in need of support, we encourage you to reach out to the numbers listed on the screen. Uh, I'll name a few of them. The NAMI Teen Text Support Line at 207-515-8398 the National Crisis Text Line, which you can text home to 741-741, and the Main Mental Health Crisis Hotline, 1-888-568-112. For those watching via Zoom, we will collect your questions, as I said, throughout the conversation using the Q&A feature. There's no chat in this uh, webinar, but we will be using Q&A if you need to communicate with us. Um, we are not live streaming on Facebook today due to Facebook technical difficulties. Um, at the end of this presentation, uh, we will be relaying your questions to the authors and to our community guests and to ZamZam for future um, use and viewing. Uh, this program will be recorded. I'm sorry, I'm going off script. Um, before we hear from our authors, our guest Sophia from Gateway Community Services is going to give us a brief description of what uh, Gateway does and why she is here today. So now I will stop bumbling and rambling with this intro and turn it over to Sophia. Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Khalid and I work with Gateway Community Services of Maine. Um, we have locations in both the Lewiston, the great, um, the Lewiston urban area as well as the greater Portland area. Um, and a lot of people know Gateway from two arms. So there's an LLC that does um, case management, therapy services, um, BHP services. But the, um, the sector that I'm involved in is the nonprofit area where it's very much um, community focused and community driven, really. Um, all of our programs are very much youth, um, youth centered and um, we have a youth mentoring program that supports um, young immigrants from ages 15 to the age of 24 who are new to the country. And we find the mentors in the community who have similar background and experience um, to support them in their educational and um, career aspirations and also just get them engaged in the community civically and socially. So that's one of the programs we run. Um, the program that I am from and I oversee is the COVID Youth Coalition that started in the early um, months of, of the pandemic. And that's the program ZemZem is involved in as well. Um, this program has um, 20 youth 
from ages um, 17 to early 20s that really support community members with COVID responses such as PPE equipment um, and other resources and communication that um, communities um, in the Lewis and Auburn and the greater Portland may need. Um, so we are not only involved in COVID though, we are involved in other areas such as some legislative policies, um, we are also in, we've been involved in the elections this past um, year of 2020. And um, we really try to like just center all the work that we do in um, social justice and equity. Um, and I'm super excited to be here today as, as a guest um, in this work. And um, again, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Sophia, for being here and for sharing about Gateway Community Services with us. Um, now I'm going to do a little bit of introduction to our, about our featured authors, Lisa Ellen Agostini and I.W. Gregoria. Uh, Lisa Ellen Agostini is a writer, editor, and stand-up comedian from Trinidad and Tobago and the author of the YA novel Home Home. Uh, the manuscript won third prize in the 2017 Code Burt Award for Caribbean Literature. And Lisa's most recent book is the domestic noir novel, The Bread the Devil Need, which is forthcoming next month in May. And her first YA novel was The Chalice Project. I.W. Gregorio is a practicing surgeon by day and a masked avenging YA writer by night. After getting her MD at Yale, she did her residency at Stanford where she met the intersex patient who inspired her debut novel, None of the Above, which was the finalist for the 2016 Lambda Literary Award and was named to the 2016 American Library Association Rainbow List. Her second novel, which we're focusing on today, is This Is My Brain in Love, and it was published in April 2020. And she is a proud member of the Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth and a founding member of We Need, Need Diverse Books. Our youth interviewer today is Zamzam Emoj, a Lewiston filmmaker and a member of the Gen Z Project. Uh, welcome to Lisa, Sophia, and Zamzam, and I will let you Oh, go for it. Amazing to be here. My pleasure. All right, Eileen and Lisa. Um, so I guess we can just sort of start off with some basic questions. I'll sort of just dive in and ask each of you guys about your own personal life experiences and what inspired you to be the woman you are today. Um, so Eileen, I know that you're a surgeon, which is amazing, and you're also a writer. So how do you sort of manage like being a mother, a writer, and a surgeon at the same time? And what like struggles and obstacles sort of come along with that? Well, yeah, I definitely don't get very much sleep. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm constantly living hour to hour, but um, in so many ways, um, I feel like the storytelling side of me and the doctor side of me are, are really intertwined. Um, I mean, I sort of, it, it's so funny. People often ask me how, uh, urologist, um, insert your joke here, um, became a writer, but it's actually kind of the opposite. Like how did a writer become a urologist? Because when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a writer because I grew up in um, a pretty uh, suburb, like rural, almost rural area of upstate New York um, where I was one of the very few people of color um, in my school. And so I always felt kind of like an outsider and books were my best friends, you know? Um, there were so many um, aspects where there's so many times when reading gave me the outlet to like get outside of my small community and so I always wanted to be a writer just because I always wanted to um, give people that, that sense of closeness in the worldview that I achieved from books and um, at some point along you know in high school my, my family was like well how are you going to eat and, so, and also my family was really from a, um, a family of healthcare providers and in some ways medicine became a little bit of a default for, you know, a kid who was pretty good in science. But um, in many ways, it, the, the two really complement each other um, because um, I feel like medicine is all about stories. Um, medicine is about, you know, taking a history and like finding out, teasing out all the, the different aspects of someone's past and, you know, the things that set them out up for the the, the issues that their bodies are dealing with. And um, it's, uh, there, there was certainly a point in high school where I realized, you know, everything I was writing was just a really, like a copy of what I'd read. And so I needed to have my own life experience and I needed to 
sort of know how people work and like what, you know, medicine has so many stories built in, inside of it. Um, and, uh, and it just grew from there. I never stopped writing, um, but medicine just allowed me to focus uh, for what I wanted to write. Um, I, uh, I've always been a writer. Uh, when I was a little kid, like six, seven, I started journaling. And from there, I was writing very bad poetry at like age nine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just, it continued from there. I was the first person in my family to be a writer. I was the first person in my family to finish university. Um, I, I don't know, I've just always written and it's always been my ambition to be a writer. So this is me living my dream, yo. <laughs> Um, I, I was a journalist uh, as my profession for many years, and I recently decided that I would, uh, it no longer brought me joy, so I stopped, and I started doing stand-up comedy, which was interesting, it is interesting, and then of course COVID <laughs> put paid entirely to the stand-up comedy career, because you can't perform if there are no performance venues open. And I don't know if you know this, but stand-up comedy needs an audience. Like it's very, it, it falls very flat a lot of the time when you're doing it without people to respond to. So um, I kind of shifted a bit um, into doing, um, I do a live uh, once a week with, I have a comedy partner and we have a company called Femcom because I'm a feminist comedian, get it, Famcom. And Famcom does a live once a week where we just sit and talk rubbish, basically. We just, what Caribbean people call old talk or Trinidadians call liming. And we, it, so we, it's a mixture of current events. Sometimes we bring in guests, but mostly it's just she and I just talking like two women who have kids and husbands and like, you know, that so um so that's where I am now like I said living the dream which is sometimes challenging because um listen Eileen your parents are right to tell you get a because <laughs> you know <laughs> you know um it's been financially interesting trying to be a writer full-time but I'm glad that I made that decision because um I really do feel like this is what I'm made for that's why I'm here. And, um, and I just want to be as good at it as I possibly can so that I can do the job properly. You know, so that's me. All right. Um, so both of you are women of color and I mean brought that up. And I just wanted to talk a bit about how, so first of all, it's amazing to just see, you know, women of color accomplishing all these things here, inspiring other young girls to, you know, grow up and young women of color to grow up and be like oh yeah I can do that because they did too so but obviously that comes with its own difficulties and challenges and you know that could sort of prevent us from really opening doors for ourselves being women of color living in this world you know so was there like an experience you had where you just felt like oh like I can't do this anymore because because of your identity and feeling like that was like a part of your identity was sort of holding you back and how were you able to overcome that? I mean, definitely. Um, so as we all, I think that, so as you guys know, I'm, I'm one of the founding members of We Need Diverse Books, um, which is sort of a grassroots organization that tried to really bring attention to and highlight and find solutions to the fact that so many stories written these days were, were, were written, uh, not written by white people. There weren't enough, like our, our shelves were not reflecting um, the population of the United States. Um, and the, the, the main reason I felt so passionate about it is that um, obviously I grew up in a very um, rural area and like it, these books that are behind me right now, these books written by um, Asian authors or black authors, um, they, would, they were not available when I was a kid. I mean, if, if you look at my childhood bookshelf, maybe 
two or three of the authors were people of color. And so Jacqueline Woodson once said that she didn't know what she didn't know about, she never really, it, it, it took a, to actually see someone in order to a writer of color to realize that she could be that. Um, so many kids grew up not realizing, thinking that this is what literature looks like. You know, the, the canon of literature is all, you know, white men. And it, children's books in many ways, um, when I was growing up was, was very much so as well. I mean, it might have been white women instead of white men, but it was still overwhelmingly um, white. And Walter Dean Myers wrote about the apartheid of children's literature. And for so many years, um, books about people of color were books, you know, or about slavery or immigration, and they were issue books, you know, and they were really siloed into, this is books for people like that. Um, and so when I wrote my very first novel, um, when I was in residency, I wanted to write a book about um, a kid like me. And so I wrote a very thinly veiled autobiography about um, an Asian American girl growing up in upstate New York. And um, I mean, it had, a, it, had a, it had a hook, it was about a mathlete turned sex expert, you know, it had, you know, this edgy aspect to it. Um, and at, I was lucky enough to get an agent, you know, fairly quickly. But when we went out on submission, um, we got a lot of feedbacks from editors saying, oh, you know, we love this. We love this plot. We love Eileen's voice. But, you know, it's too similar to another Asian American book on our list, as if there could only be one. And that we got this from three separate big five publishing houses, specifically calling out the one other Asian American book on their list. And it was depressing. It was horrible. Um, it made me feel like my story um, was less than and that, um, you know, it, that no one wanted to read my story. Um, and so when I did write my first book, um, interestingly enough, I entirely whitewashed it. So my book, my first book was about a different type of diversity. It was about biological diversity, you know, people who were born intersex, neither male nor female, but with biological characteristics where their outside doesn't match their inside. And um, when I wrote this, I made my, my, my main character a white girl, you know, because at that point, there is this idea that there could be too much diversity in books. I mean, this is, that's an actual line that was quoted in many, any, many re book reviews at the time, right? You know, people would say that it was not, it was implausibly diverse. I right? you know that you couldn't have too many issues. And so I whitewashed my oats. My, I put, I said it in my high school, but in my high school without me, you know, without my friends of color. And um, it was my editor actually who like pointed out to me when I became involved in We Night Diverse Books. Um, where, so you're involved in this, where are your, where's your diversity? And I'm like, I took it out because I thought that that was what publishing want. Um, and so um, luckily I feel like things have changed in the past five or six years. Um, and, uh, and it's been a hard struggle and there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm really proud that these books, you know, a lot of which, a lot of, um, which were written in the past five years are getting are getting published and are getting traction and are getting attention um, because there is so much more to this world than than, than what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Eileen, your story breaks my heart because I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry that you were put into that position where you had to make that choice. It's heartbreaking. But congratulations on getting through at any cost because if a million books are published, maybe, I don't know, 5% are by people of color. So I, that's not a real statistic, guys. I am not a reporter anymore. I don't know if that's the truth in terms of numerical, but it's a very thin slice of the pie. I've been actually blessed in a kind of way. I, um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, where I still live and work. And Trinidad and Tobago is an ex-British colony. And in 1962, it became uh, an independent country and it's um, run by people of color, ostensibly for people of color. Um, I'm the minority, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in the majority in, in our country. Um, we, our population is um, of African heritage, Indian heritage, Syrian, Lebanese heritage, Chinese heritage. Um, we have an incredible mixture and we do have some white people, but it's like, they are the minority, they are the thin slice. And, and the advantage of this, um, there are many disadvantages of it, <laughs> right? So we'll put those aside for a second. 
But the advantage of growing up a person of color in a country run by people of color is that there was a concerted effort to have diverse books. So that I did grow up reading Caribbean books by Caribbean authors. Fewer women, because the canon is mostly male. That's now changing. But I did have access to those. I remember reading books by Jamaican authors, Guyanese authors, African authors. I studied Chinua Achebe in school, you know. And so um, I, I felt very much grounded as a writer in a Caribbean tradition. I self-published a book of poems when I was about 18. And I do have a poem in there talking about how I wanted to be like these Caribbean authors, like, I don't know if you know the names, but Samuel Selvon, Earl Lovelace, um, you know, these are important writers in our canon and they're black like me so, or, or Indian, you know? So it, for me, there was a path that as a woman, as a female writer who maybe wasn't writing the kinds of books that those canon writers wrote, but at least I had a sense that there was a way for me to go you know, that this was a path that I could tread. The problem was that to get publication, you most of the time had to be living away. You could be a Caribbean writer, but based in London, based in New York. You needed an agent. An agent wouldn't sign you if you're living in the Caribbean. I still don't have an agent, by the way. I've published this book that's coming out next month is my seventh book, I think. And I still have no agent. God is good to me, he likes me, so he pushes the stuff. But, you know, in terms of those kinds of um, benefits of, of being abroad, I didn't, I didn't have access to that. And by choice, I decided, this is my country. I want to stay here. I'm going to figure it out. God will help me. And bless him, he did. So, but the question of, the books being too diverse. Maybe that's something that kept me from publication. Who knows? I don't know. Because I didn't have an agent, I didn't get those feedback letters. I got, I got letters saying, thank you, but we're not accepting. That's it. You know, and so it was a little lonely, pushing on by myself. But, you know, as I said, thank God I got through and I'm here. Um, as for diversity of characters in my work, I write about, largely I write about Caribbean characters because I think we're great and I want more of them in the world, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that, that's, that's my sort of grounding for making the decision to write um, the characters that I write. Thank you. Did I answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um. Thinking. I'm just processing. Um, well, at least you guys are here and very well accomplished, I see. So I'm glad you guys have gotten through it. Um, so speaking of characters, so um, do you guys, when you write, do you feel like some of the things you write come from your own experiences as an individual? And the characters might be inspired by people in your own life, or is it sort of just like fictional? Or is, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, do you tend to find yourself always writing about your experiences and being inspired by that? Or is it always inspired by some person or, e or event that's happened in your life? Or it can just be fictional all the way, but I was just interested and wanted to hear from an author how that sort of works. Can I go first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I write, hmm. when I start to write, I zone out and I write whatever comes, right? So that's my process where I kind of consciously, unconsciously um, create out of whatever's up there. So my theory is that whatever you put in, like, um, it's like any kind of data product. What you put in is what you get out. So I was very fortunate to have put in a lot of interesting experiences. Unfortunate to have put in an abusive childhood. Um, 
you know, got pregnant at nine, at 18, had a, was married and had a kid at 19, divorced by, you know, so I put in a lot of experiences, but I also, I read voraciously so that I'm sure there are pieces of other people's writing and characters sort of sprinkled, you know, like Salt Bay. I'm like, I Salt Bay that with other people's stuff. Um, a lot of my characters, I'm told now, sound like me, um, have my voice, but they don't always have my experience. and They don't always live my life. Um, but you will see little pieces of me floating around in there um, as well. So that's, that's just kind of a general sense of, of, of how or where the stories come from. Some things are sent and some things are sort of uh, elaborated. Yeah. yeah, I kind of agree with Lisa that definitely there's so much of my life that's peppered throughout the books, just because, it, you know, so many of those details are really, those are the things that add the color to all the stories we tell. But um, I've been asked a couple of times, like looking at people looking at my two books, I'm like, what connects these books? Like, what's your brand as an author? And like, I don't know, like, I'm not like a author that you can pigeonhole as like, I wrote thrillers or I write vampire novels, but I like to say that I, I, I like to write books that start conversations. Um, because um, this is kind of going back to, you know, how I balance things as a writer and as a doctor and a mom is like, obviously I don't have that much time on my hands. And so when I write a book, I feel like I need, I feel, I feel like I have to have a mission when I write. Uh, when I was writing None of the Above, I felt a mission to tell this, you know, to tell the stories, to increase education and awareness about intersex states and how they were gateway to understanding gender and sexuality and like our bodies, right? When I, when I, and, and for the, my second book, it took me five years to write it because for a long time I had, I was like, what am I going to write next? And, and it turned out that I wanted to write a happy book about mental illness. Um, and that's because um, I grew up, you know, living most of my life with undiagnosed anxiety and depression um, because I grew up in an immigrant family where, you know, eyes were always on, you know, you know, success and like getting a good education and on that prize at the end, you know, of, you know, raising a family out of poverty, you know, I'm two generations away from, you know, people, you know, who, who had food insecurity. And so um, when, you know, when I think about my childhood, um, there were so many times when people could have stepped in and said, you know, I mean, I think there's something wrong. You know, I think that there could, you could be getting help. But for so many immigrants, Mental illness is sort of an American disease, right? You know, it's something that is a lug sort of a luxury to be able to afford a therapist, to be able to think about, you know, your mental health when, you know, so many people are struggling just to survive. And um, so I denied that for many years. And, and my impetus in writing, this is in my brain and love, is that, you know, I'm a mother now, you know, I don't want my child to have to go through that. I want her to be able to have the language to talk about it and to realize that you can, you know, if you can identify how you're feeling and address it early enough, you know, you can access so many, you can access therapy, you can access medications, you don't have to live that way. Um, and, you know, so many books about mental illness, I think these days are really focused on death by suicide. You know, sometimes they fetishize the act of suicide. And um, I think that it's important when you're talking about diversity to have diverse diversity, you know, to show that, you know, there's a spectrum of mental illness and that there are so many points that you can access, not get to that devastating standpoint. And um, so that, so that's what this is my brain and love. Thank you. So I you actually got right into my um, next question, which was actually about the different perceptions that different cultures have on mental illness, which, you know, I'm an immigrant too, and mental, mental illness sort, sort of just swept under the rug. It's never a priority or it's never really paid attention to, which is a sad thing because in America, it is a luxury for these um, American families to be able to, you know, talk to their children um, and give them that emotional support that they need. And it could be hard in different cultures. So I guess just like, being able to write about it and being inspired by sorts of different things that revolve around mental health. Do you feel like that's 
helping um, the communities you come from in a way, maybe the younger generation, but I don't know, how do you sort of feel about inspiring different communities? So I, I mean, I, it's one of the most- Make that a priority or how, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, obviously things are getting better. You know, I feel like the discussion is much more open than it was, you know, 10 years ago. I, I it was 20 or 30 years ago when Tipper Gore first like tried to create this mental health awareness, um, even for the, like the administrative level of the presidency and the vice presidency, but it's still, there's still so much taboo surrounding it and there's still the, the stigma attached with it. I mean, I struggled for a while um, when this book was about to be published about hope and how open I wanted to be about my own mental health because it scared me. Um, it scared me to think that, you know, my patients could Google me and think, oh, this doctor's crazy. I'm not gonna go, <laughs> go take, be taken care of by her. She must have issues, you know? And it's still something that in the back of my head, sometimes I think, oh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe people think I'm weak because of this, but I try to invert that. And I try to um, tell myself that actually this weakness is my strength in so many ways, because um, I think that my experiences have given me a lot of empathy for what patients go through. It allows me to sometimes sit down and, and talk to them about deeper things. Um, and things are changing, you know, it's been really, I think one of the biggest things that has happened in the past few years is, um, you know, as more and more, unfortunately, suicides do, death by suicides do happen, um, you know, more and more celebrities are coming out to discuss mental illness. I mean, Michael Phelps, like, did a whole documentary about how uh, the, how mental, how depression and anxiety occur within Olympic athletes, you know, and so there's a whole, again, demystifying the fact that this happens so commonly and so many people who you wouldn't think of as, you know, struggling with these issues, deal with them. I think that that's incredibly um, important and, and inspiring, especially for people of color, because um, so many times um, those communities either can't tolerate the discussion or don't want, or, you know, or want to, to push it to the side. Um, because of you know cultural reasons, and, and same for me here. Um, <clears throat> I started talking about my own mental health issues, but when I was a journalist, because I had a column, so I used to write about depression, anxiety, um, and I guess I was young and dumb and didn't realize it might have a lasting effect on my career. But by the time I came around to writing Home Home, I was already kind of known as someone who, you know, spoke about mental health issues in a country where it is still shameful to have a mental health diagnosis. It is still shameful to have been hospitalized for mental health, um, you know, mental illness. It's still shameful to have had, you know, depression so bad that you had to, you know, change your job or something like that. And, um, I'm one of the few people, but thank God, growing number of people in the region who are talking as advocates of, you know, mental health awareness. And, and so I've, um, I, I'm pretty sure I've lost jobs because of it. <laughs> you know, I've lost work because of it. Um, I've probably, I don't know, probably lost really, who knows, but I am glad that I can be, especially because um, young adult books are so influential. When you bounce up a young adult book as a young person, where you have a character who's going through what you are going through, and finally you can language, like you can have a language for, oh, that's why I feel this way. Oh, you mean I'm not the only one who feels this way? Oh, you mean I'm not the only one who's done this horrible, shameful, awful thing that my family would like totally flip out if they knew? Um, it gives you a sense of uh, a, a, a kind of liberation that you can now name the thing and then also understand that if you can name it, then you can treat with it differently because it's not something you have to bury 
because it's like it's layers of oppression because it's the feeling. So it's the situation that has you feeling bad. Plus then it's the bad feeling. And then you have the bad feeling for feeling the bad feeling. And when you're trying to hide all of that, it makes everything worse. So just being able to say, look, I possibly am anxious or I possibly have a panic disorder and that, you know, those things are treatable and we can talk about them and talking about them and treating them can help. I, I feel really, um, I feel really glad that my experience has been, you know, able to lead me to this, this place where the, the work can help other people, especially young people. And I think it's kind of ironic in some ways for me as a doctor to look back and realize how long I denied myself, you know, medications that I need. Um, I like to say now that just the term mental illness is so misleading, right? Because when you say something mental, it's all in their head, like it's not real, but that's totally not true. I mean, this is biology, you know, there are neurotrans, there are chemicals, it's a chemical imbalance. And I remember when um, I had a therapist during my research year of residency and, and I told it because I'd been on and off medications three or four times. And every time I got better, you know, I'd be like, oh, I don't need them anymore because being on medication was a sign of weakness. And then finally, my psychologist was just like, you know, Eileen, you need to go back on this. Your brain needs serotonin. And I was thinking, duh. I mean, I would never deny a diabetic insulin. Why would I deny myself, you know, a medication that I need? in order to live a fulfilling life. And so it took decades for that, for me to come to that realization. And I was a doctor that, you know, mental illness isn't just mental, it's also biological. Thank you guys for answering that question. Um, so Lisa, I, looking at some of the themes you write about, and I don't know the information about whether you've lived in the United States before or you've been located in Trinidad all your life. But actually first, can you just answer that so that I can get to the second question so that uh, I know. I've, um, I've spent short times um, in the US. Um, so like way before you were born, I had a journalism fellowship to the Washington Post. And I spent mm -hmm. like six months in DC living and working as a journalist. Uh, but yeah. I've, but, uh, and I've spent short periods in Canada, um, another Caribbean island as well called Grenada. But I've lived in Trinidad and Tobago pretty much my whole life. Okay. So you, I was just, I was just wondering because you mentioned that you live in Trinidad and that white people are actually the minority there, um, which is a good thing. But, um, so I read that in your themes, it talked a bit about like racism and prejudice and discrimination and being the majority apart, like in a country where, you know, white people are the minorities. I just was wondering, um, I guess where sort of the inspiration to write about these like issues comes from. Mm. So that's why I just wanted to ask that, I guess. So home, home, um, the, the book that is, um, which I ought to have a copy of, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not actually home home at all. I'm in Tobago, I live in Trinidad, two different islands. Um, but home home is about a 14 year old girl who is only diagnosed after she attempts suicide. And so it's, it's not about her suicide attempt, it's about her journey into recovery and Unfortunately, for very many young people, because of the stigma around depression, anxiety, and all of these conditions, there is not a lot of counseling, there's not a lot of treatment. So there are people who are treated, but it's so expensive that for the average person um, with like an average income, you can't afford it. As an adult, I couldn't afford it. You know what I mean? So for me, the, the idea to set the book in another country where she could access those things helped. 
because if she was if it was set in Trinidad, it would be a different book. But of course, setting it in another country then puts her in the position of now being in a minority. And it's something she does, the character does discuss in the book because um, interestingly, Zam Zam, and, and also Eileen, I've only had white editors. Is that weird? That's weird. <laughs> I've only ever had white editors and most of them have sure. not been- That's the norm. Ha, have They're not the, been Trinidadian. 90% 90, 90 of editors are white. I mean. <laughs> So that they would have me do this thing where they, I would like have to explain everything and explain everything. And like, and they would ask these questions like, is that really true? That doesn't sound true. I'm like, it's, I live here. It's true. <laughs> you know, and um, I mean, wonderful editors, really good editors. But because they are now looking at my world that I've created through their lens, it kind of pushed me and forced me in a good way sometimes to explain things and to make things clearer that I would just take for granted. And one of the things that I had to explain was this whole question of colorism in the Caribbean, which I don't know, Eileen, if you have it in your um, community or Zam Zam, but so we have ways that we rate people according to the color of their skin and the closer to white you are, it's almost like you get a props, you know, like good for you, you're closer to white. And like the darker your skin tone, the harder it is to get a job, to get a boyfriend, to, you know what I, everything. And so I deal with that in the section because the character is very dark skinned. Uh, I know, yeah, I know. It's imagination, Zam Zam, it's imagination. <laughs> So the character is very dark skinned. And so she has this whole thing about um, what it, the, the difference between being perceived as a black person in North America, in Canada, where she is, and how it was when she was in Trinidad um, as a black person or among black people, but then being like rated on this weird scale and how that affected her. So there are things that, um, yeah, I did, I did, um, I did touch on it. And a lot of it is, you know what? I read a thousand million trillion books mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them would have been immigrant stories. So I kind of know that experience of you living in somebody's basement and you're feeling like you owe them just for the fact that you're here and you're not catching your skin somewhere else, you know? Um, so I understand that. And, and also uh, I have a lot of older brothers and sisters and most of them left and live elsewhere. So I do kind of know secondhand or even thirdhand that experience of being an immigrant. And that's so a lot of it is in my imagination. That's how I come to write about an immigrant girl when I've never been an immigrant myself. That's so yeah, um, there's definitely colorism here in the United States too. So I'm glad that you are running about a character who is facing, who sort of faced colorism back in her own country and then just facing racism and discrimination while also, you know, having these experiences of just, you know, being a dark skinned woman. Um, so I, I don't think there's really, I've never really even heard about a book where the character is actually dark skin I guess and nobody really ever talks about colorism in books so I think it's a good thing that to just bring awareness to that because they're, they're like a light-skinned person and dark-skinned woman in a different country can will not have the same experiences but also in the United States in some ways with like the communities and cultures they're in those like experiences can still be different but they can still face the same racism and discrimination from the white people um, so yeah, I, I myself am, am a dark skinned woman and it's, I'm just happy to hear a book where, hear about a book where those issues are brought up, I guess. So, um, because when things aren't just, when things aren't brought up and discussed, like it's easy to feel gaslit. Like, am I crazy? You know? But no, it, I mean, even within Asian cultures, like I remember my mom going to the 
beach with this group of Taiwanese tourists and um, and none of the people wanted to suntan because they didn't want to look dark because peasants were dark, you know, because, and you know, it, it's, it's insidious, um, but just even acknowledging it um, makes it easier to deal with sometimes. Anything else you guys would like to add to that um, subject topic? I mean, I would like to um, point out that one of the things that um, We Need Diverse Books is trying to do um, in changing the publishing industry is not just amplify white off, uh, sorry, authors of color, um, but also to address the lack of diversity within the publishing industry because publishing is overwhelmingly white and female and wealthy because it is expensive to live in New York. And yeah. so in order to be even be able to get into publishing, you need to be able to afford doing an often unpaid internship and, live in, and be able to live in New York. I mean, the pandemic oh. in some ways has broadened that a bit because it's um, allowed people to do more remote work within publishing. You know, it's possible that things are changing, but one of the things that We Need Diverse did was start an internship program um, to bring, you know, people of color who are interested in publishing, um, give them internships to be able to get the foot in the door. Um, because um, it is extremely rare. I was really, really, really lucky with This Is My Brain and Love to have um, an Asian editor, Alvina Ling, who's not only Asian, but specifically Taiwanese. And she got my book in ways that some other editors, even other editors of color didn't. For example, um, This Is My Brain and Love, when we, we did go to auction and when I was talking to different editors, one of them who was um, Chinese, not Taiwanese, actually, <clears throat> asked me, are you actually Chinese? Because I was using the Taiwanese word for grandma, not the Chinese word for grandma. And she was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, and it's one of the critic critiques she had of the book. And so it just goes to show how, how, how challenging it can be to find the, the editors who, who are able to actually see your book for what it is and, and to get your book. Um, when, you're, when you're not white. Eileen, I have two people to recommend for that internship. Is there an age limit and a geographical? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh go my to, God. Um, go to diversebooks.org and it's a yearly internship. So. Oh, I'm gonna recommend this right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole idea of being a, a writer is kind of, to a lot of people of color and a lot of communities of color, it's, it's kind of like a fairy tale profession. What is a writer? Like, is that a real thing? Is that a real job? Who is a writer? You know, and um, for me to actually, like I said, you know, live the dream is, is, is a real privilege I'm aware of. But I'd love for more women of color, more, more people of color, more Caribbean people to get involved in the public, publish, publishing industry because the more diverse the editors and publishers are the better the books we have you know as a whole as a world you know yeah. mm -hmm. I actually used to want to be a writer when I was in eighth grade which is interesting because I guess like I would write these tiny little things for my friends it was like these weird little love stories and like it was fictional characters and I'd write them and we like pass it around each week somebody would get it and they would read it and it was this thing me and my friend used to do. Um, and eventually, like, oh, I was like, oh, I want to be a writer. But then I was sort of just inspired. I watched a documentary and was inspired to become a filmmaker. And I was like, oh, like, you know, when people write, they can make these things come to life and on film. Like, there are lots of books where they sort of just project those things onto film and people get to see it, like, in action, which I think is just the most beautiful thing ever. So I'll, it's just amazing what writers can do and how people in the film industry can take that and sort of just bring it to life. Can I just say that uh, I also used to do that. I used to write these little love stories on folder pages mm -hmm. and pass them around my class. So everybody knew I was a writer. And I think the difference for me was I didn't think, fil look, there was like maybe two filmmakers in my country. <laughs> You know, that's not, that's an exaggeration. We did have a TV station and so on, but to be a filmmaker was not, I thought about being a playwright. 
because a play was something I could imagine I could do. Um, but I never thought about myself as a filmmaker, as, as a possibility, as a real thing and until now. So I'm really happy that you've actually skipped a step. But I want to say to Zam Zam, but that the writing is the visioning of the film. So you're still writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Kelly and I have popped back on so we can take uh, questions from the audience. We've got a couple come in through uh, YouTube where I figured out the streaming. Um, and also, if anyone on Zoom wants to, the Q&A is down at the bottom and you can submit, submit things and we'll read them out loud for a few more minutes. Also, I want to say that when we post the recording of this video, I will definitely post the link to We Need Diverse Books so everyone can find those awesome internships and all of their awesome resources. Um, and Zam Zam, I can post the link to the Gen Z YouTube page where you can watch some of the, the Zam Zam videos too. Uh, I have one question that came in, um, and I think both Eileen and Lisa, you could take turns answering this. Uh, do you have any advice for young adults who may be struggling to express the seriousness of their mental health struggles to their families or communities, uh, specifically in relation to like immigrant families? Um, whoever wants to go first. I was hoping the doctor would jump in. Um, <laughs> like a clinical <laughs> recommendation. I, um, I would say if you are feeling bad and can't function or the way you're feeling is affecting your life, like you can't get up in the morning or you don't want to be around the people you love or you want to hurt yourself, I would say find a loving adult. It doesn't have to be your parent, but somebody who cares about you and tell them how you feel. And that's like a great first step because sometimes you go to our parents and they don't understand. Or we have a thing in the Caribbean, in Trinidad, we say, you ass too damn happy, which means that basically you have nothing to be sad about. So get over it. And that's the wrong thing to say. So maybe your parent might not be the first person but you might have a teacher who you know cares about you. Or you might have a person you play basketball with who you know cares about you. You know, just reach out to them and, and together you can find that first step. That's my suggestion. What do you think, Doc? Oh, I, I agree. I, I really want to latch on the idea that if, if you're not ready to talk to your family, um, there are, you know, teachers, um, are great resources. Librarians are great resources. A lot of libraries have social workers these days. Um, and um, so on my website, if you go to iwgregorio.com, um, there's a link at the top to a, men a tab for mental health resources. And one of the resources um, I cut and paste from, uh, it's sort of like a blog, I don't know if it's a blog or a listserv called Foreign Bodies. Um, and it's a Substack thing that you can subscribe to, which is a group, of, a group of letters and resources that's specifically targeted for immigrant communities in regards to mental health. And on my, that website, I actually have tips from a doctor um, at Stanford um, where I did my residency on things that people can, can, like tips for youth and young adults before, during, and after the talk with their parents. And there's also a tip for parents too on what to do when their child comes to them. Um, and the first advice, and I'm totally cribbing from them. So check out four in like the number four N as in the letter N bodies. Um, first one is to do your research and that's where your libraries can help you, right? Because the libraries can, you know, maybe you can find a book that you're, you're you might want your parents to read and you can slip it to them or, you know, um, and, and just lay the groundwork for understanding these issues. Sometimes a lot of times media, like watching a movie and like using that as a discussion point to say, you know, sometimes I feel that way, for instance, or like, hey, did you know that that actor recently came out as having, is suffering from depression? Um, and hey, you know, successful people can have anxiety and depression too. Um, and also um, back to the whole idea of teachers, um, for a lot of people, 
um, teachers are the first people to identify when there's an issue because they might be having academic issues, you know, struggling. And I don't know, for me, for my Asian family, if my grades were slipping, my parents would be very interested. <laughs> so you can use that as leverage too, um, to show that, you know, mental health issues aren't a weakness necessarily. They are a way to make you, they can be in a way to identify ways to make you stronger, you know? Um, you know, make you stronger as a person, make you stronger as a family. Um, and and it's, it can be hard, um, but know that you're not alone. Um, and, you know, the things that, um, one of the things that the foreign bodies um, advice talks about is the fact that young people, when they approach their parents, have to keep in mind that their parents may also be living with trauma um, and mental illness. And, and, and spoiler alert, that's a little plot point, and this is my brain in love. Um, because, you know, a lot of adults, maybe parents might think, oh, this is never, this is something that I had to live through and suffer, you know, you should have to live through and suffer it too. Um, but that's not, you know, I just knowing that, you know, knowing where your parents are coming from is, is huge. Um, and, um, other op other suggestions are not to sugarcoat your symptoms. So that's when, you know, the checklist of like, if you go to like any depression screener, they'll ask about, you know, whether you're having trouble sleeping, whether your appetite is different, you know, whether you've been struggling um, with getting out of bed, like, like Lisa said, you know, asking if um, you are having physical symptoms of anxiety, like elevated heart rate and palpitations, um, and then focuses, focus on the positives and like, and what, and on instances where, you know, therapy and treatment can really, really help. Um, so that's a, you know, it's it's definitely a, a discussion that you have to go into being prepared, uh, but that's again, another way in which libraries can be a great resource. Thank you for the library shout out, Lisa. I mean, Eileen, um, I'll definitely also post the link to, to your website and some of the other resources uh, that you have for mental health resources for people of color and immigrants look amazing. Uh, therapy for Black Girls, the Asian American Mental Health Resources Toolkit, uh, Muslims Thrive Mental Health Resources, and the Registry of Professionals, the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network, so many amazing things. Um, I know that uh, Eileen has to go run back into surgery <laughs> at the end of this, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, Kelly, do you want to say our little farewell? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one last thing about librarians that folks might know or forget. Your privacy is super important to us. Um, librarians have, privacy is a value of ours in our profession. So you don't have to be afraid to come to a library to look for books about anything or to ask for help finding things. We keep your privacy it's very important to us and we would never disclose that to anybody. You don't have to worry about, oh, they're gonna judge me for checking out this book or asking for this topic. That is not what we do. So don't be afraid to reach out to your library or a librarian if you're looking for information. And I, I wanna thank you, Eileen, for, for saying that. Um, and to wrap up, I just wanna thank you all, um, ZamZam included for being so vulnerable and sharing your experiences. This conversation was so important. Um, and I wanna thank our authors for the amazing work they are doing in YA um, and beyond, um, trying to diversify publishing um, and everything you do. Uh, if you would like to learn more about our authors, Harper has put up uh, a, a slide with their websites, their social media, covers of their books, which you can get at the library. Um, we have them digitally and in print. Also, I wanna mention our local bookstore print um, carries um, all of these authors' books or find your own local bookstore. Please support local bookstores and buy these books. Um, print uh, is our um, local bookstore. And if you need any information on this, we can find it on our website afterwards. This has been recorded, so we will be um, posting this to both the Lewiston Public Library and the Portland Public Library YouTube channels um, within the week uh, if you'd like to watch this again or share it with anyone. Uh, finally, this is our 
last Read Your Mind um, of this school year. If you appreciated this conversation, you can watch the recordings, as I mentioned. Um, and if you have comments or suggestions for Read Your Minds for the next school year, we would love to hear from you. Um, if there are authors you wanna hear from, topics you wanna to make sure we discuss, please let us know. Thank you for everybody that joined us today. Um, what an amazing couple of books and authors to end this series on. Zam Zam, I wanna thank you so much. Um, you are an awesome interviewer uh, and wish you all the best. And I wanna thank Gateway Community Services and Safia for being here as well. Um, and it's about one o'clock. I want Eileen to be able to get to surgery. Uh, so we are going to end here. Um, if you have any questions or need anything, please reach out to the library and we will connect you with all of this information. Thank you everybody so much. It was Before great. Before you quit. Oh I yeah. I want to say thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And I really enjoyed meeting all of you. Um, God bless all of you. I, I hope this continues and grows from strength to strength. Thank Hope you. to meet you all in person yeah, someday. Thank you for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for having me. Everybody be safe and healthy and reach out if you need anything.